Hi everybody, it's DK with Mr. V Amps here, and I'd like to discuss with you briefly the number one reason that solid state amplifiers fail, in my opinion, based on what I've seen here at the shop. Now it is very possible to have an amplifier such as these that are 50 years old and solid state, and they still work fine with most of the original parts in them or something like this big boy that's 30 some years old and still kicking really kicking out the jams again still mostly original parts actually if not all and then there are units like this poor fender bxr 100 where the whole entire back row of transistors is all blown to smithereens and shorted out and that happens a lot a very high percentage of dead solid state amps that I deal with seem to be most commonly the output transistors going kablooey. So let's address why that can happen and the number one way that you can avoid doing that. Uh, I recall amps from Heartkey that we fixed, uh, ones from Fender that we fixed, uh, Standell, you know, a lot of these and uh, always seems to be those output transistors. But not always in the case of our Fender PXR we did recently. Okay, this is the schematic for the power amp board of our Custom 200, our old school bass amps. And as you can see, there is our speaker output and it's directly coupled to these four output transistors. The only thing between these and the speaker is a 1 ohm resistor. That's not much. And then we have the schematic for the power amp area of the Fender BXR100 like we fixed recently. And again, the same kind of deal. Your um, output transistors are directly coupled to your speaker. Now there is a headphone jack here and that applies some static load to it uh, to emulate a speaker I guess to lower the volume but uh, you're dealing with um, 0 0.47 ohm so a half an ohm resistors between your output transistors and your speaker and that although will help yield a lot of power and save a lot of money on output transformers can certainly be a problem. In order to operate safely these type of amplifiers need an output load. It's not coming in the form of an output transformer it's coming in the form of your speakers and depending on your amplifier design or who made it there's going to be a minimum load that is safe to use on your amplifier. Although it may depend on the model amplifier that you have, rule number one would be never power on your solid state amplifier unless a speaker is properly connected. Particularly in smaller combo amps, um, there are solid state output modules, transistor arrays, etc. that will fail very quickly if there is no speaker connected. If your amp fails to produce sound initially, power it back down and check all of your speaker connections. Make sure you're using the bright cables, that your cables are clean, and that you plugged everything into the right place. Again, getting things miswired and goofed up is one of the common things I see where amps are absolutely blown to smithereens. If you have a little combo amp with an open back, you may be encouraged to throw an effect pedal or your guitar strap or something inside of the amp to make it easier to carry. And that's just fine. But make sure you're not hitting those speaker terminals. If you knock one of them off and power up your amplifier, particularly on a small one like this, it's possible that the amp would fail within a very, very short time of being powered up, having no speaker 
present. Number three would be never connect a speaker load lower than what your amp was designed for. If your amp came with an 8 ohm speaker in it, don't put a 4 ohm in there, please, just don't. It might be fun to want to add additional speakers and make a big speaker cabinet for your amp that has more speakers in it than your original cabinet may have. And that's fine, but again, observe the total impedance and do not go lower than the factory recommended impedance of the amplifier. If you're ever picking up speakers off the street or you found some in some old junk amp, make sure you test them with your multimeter to make sure the coils are not shorted or opened before trying to connect them. Sometimes if a speaker is driven too hard, the coil inside will fuse, resulting in a significantly lower load um, than belongs, or it could be completely open, meaning that it will present no load. And again, either of those conditions could be dangerous to your amplifier, depending on design. This is actually a great guide from Eminence. You can get it right off their website on the impedances of hooking up multiple speakers in case you want to upgrade your amp or build your own speaker cabinet or reload some speaker cabinets you got on Craigslist for chump change. It shows the parallel wiring configuration for two speakers. Two 4 ohm speakers in parallel equals a 2 ohm load. Two 8 ohm speakers in parallel equals a 4 ohm load. And two 16 ohm speakers in parallel equals an 8 ohm load. Not too tough. It shows how to wire them in series. You can actually just add them. So two 4 ohms is 8, two 8 ohms is 16. This is what you have by default on a Vox AC30 actually. There's four speakers in parallel, common on your 412 cabs, or they may be switchable between series and parallel. Some of your Marshall cabs I know have a switching mech where you can either run them as a 16 ohm or a 4 ohm, and it would be the difference between running them as a series or a parallel, and it's a switch on the back you can configure. But four speakers in parallel, you have your four 8 ohm speakers would be a 2 ohm load, four 16 ohm speakers, which is very common in a 412, it's a 4 ohm load. Four 32 ohm speakers would be an 8 ohm load. The 32 ohm speakers are commonly seen in the Ampeg SVT cabinets, your big 810 refrigerators, and uh, actually, Eight of those would be a 4 ohm load. And then there's series parallel, which is another way you could wire your cabinets. Again, to make sure that they're compatible with your amplifier. Okay, so this is actually a new speaker that I know is good, but I'll show you basically how one tests the impedance of the speaker for general health. This is an eminent speaker. It is 8 ohms according to the sticker, and we know that it is good. I have a multimeter. I will set my multimeter to read at ohms in the lowest setting, up to 200 ohms. And I'll simply place it across the two terminals of the speaker. And being an 8 ohm speaker, I should get a reading of around 8 ohms, maybe a little lower. In this case, my meter says 7.4. That means that this speaker is okay to hook up to my amplifier. Anything generally between 6 and 8 would be fine, but there are cases where I have seen 8 ohm speakers that are measuring 1 ohm, 2 ohms, because they have been overdriven and the voice coil has melted together. Dangerous to run on a solid state amp. That covers my fourth rule about testing any used speakers, or new speakers for that matter. Any unknown speaker will go with that. Rule five, select speakers that can handle a wattage well above what your amp is capable of producing. 50% or more is my recommendation. In fact, Hartley PV used to recommend 100% additional. So if you have a 100 watt amp, he recommended 200 watt speakers. 
because when you go into distortion and you're using high gain situations, the amp is actually pulsing out some pretty rough, heavy stuff. Um, and for the sake of the speaker to survive, it uh, helps to have a voice coil and assembly that is plenty stout and won't become damaged while working. If we had to select a replacement speaker example for our PV Viper 15 watt modeling amp, it tells us right now that the amplifier is capable of putting out 15 watts, 11 volts RMS into a 4 ohm load. So now we know. We could put an 8 ohm speaker if we wanted to, but a proper speaker for this would be more like, oh, I would say up to 30 watts and the speaker that's in there is actually 25 watts. Next thing we want to consider is rule number six would be to use a proper speaker cable to connect your cabinet to the amp. Now I have two cables here. We have this one and we have this one, both of which I made. They both have very similar connectors and they would both plug in between the item and the amplifier. One I should use, one I should not use. This would be the proper one to use. It's not necessarily that it's thicker, although you know, for a small amp it wouldn't make a hill of beans whether I used a thinner or a thicker one. But on the cable written here upside down, 13 AWG American Wire Gauge Professional Grade Speaker Cable. This has two equal conductors at 13 gauge wire. So it's nice heavy wire. This will be perfectly fine for that big heavy duty PV or my customs. One of those no problem carrying that kind of wattage. This is actually an instrument cable. It would work great to bridge your pedal to your guitar or your pedal to your amp or something like that. But these type of cables are only 20 wire gauge, maybe 22, maybe even 24. They're far too thin and would more than likely heat up and fail. Not good for speakers when your amp is expecting a particular type of load, varying it by having a improper cable. It's just not a good idea. And finally, rule number seven, power off your amplifier before making changes to your speaker configuration. I've had people before where they turn the amp on and like in rule number two, they're not getting any sound so they just start plugging and unplugging um, the speaker and that could really be potentially bad. It's very possible that your tip and your ring could, you know, you could somehow get it shorted, something goofy bad could happen, you know, test your cables with a meter, just don't risk playing around with the speakers. If anything, turn the amp off, pull your cables off, clean them, plug them back in, and try again. But messing around with the, with the speakers while the amp is on is very high risk and could result in leaving the magic smoke out of your amp. Solid state amps definitely have their place, they have their style, and they have a great mojo. They can really be enjoyable too. Just make sure you take good care of your solid state amp. And by all means, don't goof up your output speakers. It's the number one reason I see amps fail all the time. By the mid 60s, mid to late 60s, solid state amps had really come into their own. But there were a lot of reliability problems. And I wonder if some of them were on the users and some of them were probably on the designers. If you've got an old timer, my bets are it's probably a custom or a PV because Fender really had a rough time in their early days. Some of the older Standell amps were quite reliable too. But anyway, take care of your solid state amps, take care of your tube amps, and have a great day.